Hey everyone, so this lesson is on gout. So we're going to talk about what gout is, we're also going to talk about what causes it, some of the risk factors for getting gout, we're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So gout is an inflammatory monoarticular arthropathy. So what does all of that mean? So it involves inflammation, monoarticular, mono means one, so oftentimes it involves only one joint and it's an arthropathy. So arthropathy, disease of a joint. So it is an inflammatory disease of usually one joint, but as we'll see, you can have two or more joints being affected. It's actually caused by a deposition of monosodium urate crystals within joints. So it can be called a crystal arthropathy. So a disease of the joints due to crystals. And ultimately, this buildup of monosodium urate crystals is due to a state of hyperuricemia, high level of uric acid in the blood. We're going to talk about uric acid, how it's produced, and why it accumulates in the next slide. So what is the epidemiology of gout? A vast majority of patients that suffer from gout are men older than the age of 30. This roughly translates to at least 90% of patients. Women are affected, but oftentimes only postmenopausal. And when we look at the male to female ratio, males far outnumber females, usually two to six to one. And we also find that as an individual increases in age, the prevalence of gout increases as well. And it is estimated to affect one to 4% of the general population. So what is the pathophysiology of gout? As we mentioned in the last slide, the pathophysiology ultimately is due to monosodium urate crystals depositing in joints, and this is due to a state of hyperuricemia or a high level of uric acid in the blood. And as we'll see here, uric acid is a breakdown product of purine metabolism, and purines are nucleotide bases. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to get into all the details of the biochemical pathways here. You don't need to know all the details with regards to these pathways, but there's a couple of points I just want to make note of here. The enzyme xanthine oxidase, so xanthine oxidase helps to convert hypoxanthine to xanthine and ultimately to uric acid, and the enzyme hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase, HGPRT, which is part of the salvage pathway. Don't worry if you don't know these things. If you want more information, please check out my lessons on these topics. So you'll realize why I mentioned those here in a moment. So again, uric acid is a breakdown product of purine metabolism. We mentioned that before. And the problem in gout is that there is an excess of uric acid leading to monosodium urate crystals and eventual deposition into joints. And you can imagine that there's a couple of ways we can get excess uric acid. One of them is increased uric acid production. So if you're producing more uric acid, you can ultimately lead to a state of excess uric acid. And then if you're not able to get rid of uric acid, so decreased excretion of uric acid, this could also lead to increased levels of uric acid as well. So there's these two arms that we have to think about, increased production and decreased excretion. So in the category of increased uric acid production, we have excessive cell turnover. And excessive cell turnover can be in conditions like certain blood cancers. So if there's a lot of cells that are breaking down, those cells contain purines and we can get an increase in purine metabolism and excess uric acid. We can see this in chemotherapy. So if there's chemotherapies being used that actually destroy cancer cells, you can see that there's a lot of cell turnover. It can be a problem in hematological conditions like polycythemia rubra vera, so where there's a high level of red blood cells or a lot of production of red blood cells, we can also get this as well. And we can see it in certain genetic conditions like Lesch-Nyen syndrome. And Lesch-Nyen syndrome actually is a deficiency of HGPRT. So the enzyme we just talked about in the salvage pathway. So if there's a deficiency in that enzyme, the uric acid is not really able to be processed and reconverted. So we can get this issue with an increased uric acid production. In the category of decreased excretion of uric acid, uric acids are excreted in the renal system. So any disease of the kidneys can lead to a decreased excretion of uric acid, so renal disease. NSAID, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so these can affect the kidneys as well, and we can see issues with a decreased excretion of uric acid. And we can also see a decreased excretion of uric acid with certain diuretics and acidosis as well. So ultimately, because there's a excess level of uric acid, we can get more 
murate or monosodium murate being formed. And these crystals can accumulate in joints and then lead to the recruitment of macrophages, white blood cells, into the area. And this ultimately leads to inflammation of that area. So what happens just briefly is that macrophages come along and they see these crystals and they think, well, I'm going to actually phagocytize them. I'm going to eat these crystals up. They're not supposed to be there. And what happens is when macrophages actually phagocytize these crystals, it activates the NLRP2 inflammasome. Don't worry about what this means, but if you think about the word inflammasome, we're going to think there's going to be inflammation. And that's exactly what happens. We see an activation of caspase 1 and interleukin 1 beta, and then ultimately inflammation. And this can actually cause damage to the joint. So this is a brief mechanism of how these monosodium urate crystals lead to inflammation. Now, what are some of the risk factors for actually having gout? We talked about those mechanisms where there might be an increased production of uric acid or a decreased excretion of uric acid. So we're going to expand on that a bit more and we're going to talk about some of the patient factors as well. One risk factor for getting gout is being of the male gender. So we talked about this before. Males are two to six times more likely than females to have gout. Older age. So we talked about this before as well. As a person gets older, their prevalence of gout increases. Now, certain dietary sources can also increase the risk of having gout. These can increase the likelihood of having hyperuricemia or a high level of uric acid in the blood. Some of these include seafood. So examples include lobster and shrimp, eating organ meats like liver and kidneys, eating red meat like beef and pork, and consuming high fructose corn syrup, whether that be in certain beverages. And I have an entire category in beverages here as well to emphasize the point that alcohol is a big risk factor here, as well as sweetened drinks, oftentimes due to their containing high fructose corn syrup and again, certain sodas as well. Now, there are certain medical conditions that are also associated with an increased likelihood of gout. These include obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, congestive heart failure, and hyperlipidemia. So some of these can be due to dietary issues. Some of these can be due to decreased excretion of uric acid as well. So these conditions are often associated with gout. Another category of risk factors is medications. So medications like aspirin, cyclosporin, certain diuretics like the thiazide diuretic, so hydrochlorothiazide has been associated with an increased risk of hyperuricemia, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, and again, NSAIDs, as we mentioned before. And another category of risk factors is genetics. Now, I won't get into all the details here with regards to genetics, but it has been shown that some genes play a role in patients getting gout. So we can see certain genes being associated with an increased risk of gout. So again, you can see here, there's a lot of different risk factors for actually getting hyperuricemia and gout. What are some of the clinical features of gout? Oftentimes, patients may have asymptomatic hyperuricemia. So they have hyperuricemia, so they have high levels of uric acid in their blood, but they don't have symptoms. And oftentimes this can be occurring for years before they actually have the typical symptoms of gout. So a patient could be experiencing the state of hyperuricemia for a long time, and then all of a sudden there's a trigger leading to a gout attack. We'll talk about what a gout attack is in a moment, but I just want to talk about the triggers here. So one of the triggers is cold temperatures. Another one is surgery. Another one is stress. So stress can be trauma or something like a surgery. So this ties in with surgeries. And another one is diet. So if a patient was consuming a high level of alcohol, for instance, like beer, or if they have been eating fatty foods, or if they're taking certain medications like aspirin, this could ultimately lead to triggering of a gout attack. So what is a gout attack or a gout flare? So we call this acute gouty arthritis. So this is when we actually see this monoarticular arthropathy occurring. There's a sudden onset of severe pain, sudden and severe. Those are the key words here. And oftentimes it has been shown to be an example where it's so sudden that it can wake them up in the middle of the night or can progress in only a few hours and the pain accelerates and peaks within 24 hours of onset. So it's not like typical osteoarthritis where it's kind of an insidious presentation. This is a very sudden, severe pain. And we see with the joint, an erythematous, edematous, and warm and tender to touch joint. So red, swollen, hot, tender. With regards to the joints that are affected in gout, we see that the first metatarsophalangeal joint, so the big toe, 
the first MTP, so the joint here that is being pointed at, is actually the most common joint affected. And when this joint is affected, we have a special term for this, pedagra. So pedagra is when the first MTP in the foot is affected by gout, that is called pedagra. So this is actually the most common joint. Although we can see other joints being affected as well, these include the knee. So we actually saw a picture of that, a very red, swollen, hot, tender joint here. Ankles can be affected, tailor and subtalar joints can be affected, and the elbow, wrist, and fingers can be affected. So many joints can be affected by gout, but we often see that the first MTP or the joint we talked about in the last slide is the most common joint that's affected. And then some of these other ones can occur as well. Tendons can also be affected by gout and bursae. So we can see this kind of deposition of monosodium urate crystals and tendons and, and bursae as well. One of the bursae that become affected is the lecarnon bursa. So the bursa in the elbow. And patients with gout can also have tophi. So you might be wondering what tophi are. Tophi are subcutaneous nodules of urate deposits. So the same thing that happens in the joints can happen in subcutaneous areas as well. So you can see these nodules occurring in certain parts of the body. We often see them in the ears, joints and tendons can also be affected and you can see them in the finger pads as well. In gout, you can also see nephrolithiasis, so kidney stones, so they're uric acid stones and nephropathy. So there can be some damage to the kidneys from this as well. And there can also be some systemic symptoms. So if there's a lot of inflammation, if it's a polyarticular gout, so we talked about it being monoarticular most often, but sometimes it can affect two or more joints at the same time, it can be polyarticular. And when it's polyarticular, there can be a widespread inflammatory response and we can see fever and we can see fatigue. So how is gout diagnosed? So a lot of times it has to do with joint aspiration. So you're essentially aspirating some of the synovial fluid. So some of the fluid out of the joint essentially put a needle into that joint and aspirate out the fluid. So during a flare, the synovial fluid looks cloudy. Oftentimes it's described as being yellow in color. It's less than 50,000 white blood cells per milliliter. If it was greater than that, it would be septic arthritis. So it's not a septic arthritis. So it's not infectious. There's no bacteria, but there are crystals. So when they actually look under a slide, they see these crystals. So they see monosodium urate crystals. This is the gold standard. Once you see this, this essentially makes the diagnosis of gout. And these crystals, there's a couple of important points to note about these crystals. They are negatively birefringent and they're needle-shaped crystals. And negatively birefringent really refers to how the crystals look under polarized light microscopy. And they look yellow in appearance as opposed to in pseudogout where they're positively birefringent, rhomboid-shaped crystals. So in pseudogout, they are positively birefringent. And a way to remember that is Pseudogout starts with a P and they are positively birefringent. P for pseudogout, P for positively birefringent. As opposed to gout, it's the opposite. So it's negatively birefringent needle-shaped crystals. And again, they look yellow when exposed to polarized light microscopy. Clinicians can also look at urate levels, although sometimes these don't correlate with an acute gout flare. These can be often more looked at if the diagnosis of gout is not entirely clear. So if a clinician is not sure if the presentation is actually gout, they can look at urate levels in the blood. And if they are extremely, extremely low, that essentially excludes the diagnosis of gout or at least makes it less likely. CRP and ESR, these are inflammatory markers, so C-reactive protein can be elevated Erythrocyte sedimentation rate can also be elevated, but these are nonspecific. So we can see these being high in gout, but they're again, not specific for gout. And then there are specific radiographic findings. So findings that you can see on an X-ray. So you don't necessarily have to have radiographic findings to say this is a diagnosis. If you have joint aspiration showing monosodium urate crystals, that's the gold standard that is the diagnosis. But with radiographic findings, it's important to kind of state these. These are findings in gout. So we can see something called punched out erosions with overhanging edges. These are the words that will be used. And sometimes these are also referred to as rat bite erosions. So punched out erosions, rat bite erosions, these are the radiographic findings in gout. How is gout treated? So the treatment of gout oftentimes is split into whether a patient is going through a flare or if it's a maintenance or trying to prevent a future flare. Important point to note here is that if they have asymptomatic hyperuricemia, if they've never had a flare, there's no treatment needed. So with regards to a gout flare, 
Flares are often best treated within 24 hours of the initiation of the flare. Rest and ice packs can be used. NSAIDs can also be used, so things like naproxen. Colchicine can be used. And then systemic glucocorticoids could also be used as well, specifically used for patients that can't really tolerate colchicine or have renal failure, so shouldn't be taking NSAIDs. And then it's usually seven to 10 days of treatment. What about maintenance? And when I mean maintenance, I mean urate lowering therapy. So these therapies are for individuals who have had a flare in the past and you're trying to prevent a future flare. So these urate lowering therapies can be used. An important point to note here is that not all patients will be put on a urate lowering therapy, even if they've had a flare in the past. The American College of Rheumatology guidelines for starting one of these therapies has to do with frequent flares. So if there's greater than or equal to two or more flares per year, that is one of the criteria that's used. Having TOFI is also another one. Some issues with urolithiasis or nephrolithiasis can also be a guideline for use. And then chronic kidney disease stage two or more can also be one of the stated guidelines for starting a urate lowering therapy. So if a patient is eligible or if they are going to be started on a urate lowering therapy, one class is xanthine oxidase inhibitors. We talked about that enzyme before. Xanthine oxidase is the enzyme that essentially produces uric acid. So xanthine oxidase inhibitors can prevent the production of uric acid. These include allopurinol and fibroxostat. Uricosuric is also another type of urate lowering therapy that can be used, and this helps to actually increase the excretion of uric acid. Now, what I really want to talk about is lifestyle modification. Now, lifestyle modification should come before the treatments for flares and the urate lowering therapies. It should come before everything. So getting on top of hyperuricemia, trying to reduce uric acid levels is paramount in trying to prevent gout and any future flares of gout. So lifestyle modification, as we mentioned before, there's a lot of those risk factors and conditions that are associated with hyperuricemia and gout. So one is weight loss. So lifestyle modification, if a patient can lose weight, this can help tremendously. Staying hydrated can also help a patient increase the excretion of uric acid and reduce alcohol consumption can also be used to help with preventing gout flares and helping to lower uric acid levels as well. And then other ones include avoiding certain dietary selections like seafood, beverages with high fructose corn syrup. So these are very important lifestyle modifications. Unfortunately, even with all of these treatments and urate lowering therapies and lifestyle modification, a majority of patients will have another flare within one year. Usually 60 to 70% will have another flare in a year. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.